Okay. Hi, this is uh, Professor Patterson again. We're recording here from Donald Brand Hall. We're on the fifth floor up in the informatics department. Today we're going to talk a little bit about encryption keys and do a couple um, online videos describing this. Encryption keys are a general um, tool that people in computational systems, people that build computational systems, use uh, in a lot of different ways. And encryption keys are used in the Bitcoin algorithm and in the Bitcoin ecosystem in a variety of ways. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about encryption keys generally before we talk about them and how they're used specifically in uh, the Bitcoin uh, algorithm. Um, this is useful because you may come across different places where cryptographic keys and encryption mechanisms are used outside of um, just Bitcoin. So, you know, it's a way to think about it more generally. One of the things that some of, uh, some of the uh, discussion items that have been going on around this uh, recording have uh, pointed out is that it's really interesting that the Bitcoin computer code is publicly available. And some people have pointed out that um, isn't this a security risk? Isn't this uh, an opportunity for hackers to get in to the Bitcoin um, system and steal money, basically? And I think it's important to point out that when people design computer systems, there's two principles that they think of in terms of how to keep something secure. Um, and the first one is called security by obscurity. Oops. Obscurity means, by, means hiding something. And usually when people in, in, uh, in IT and computer science talk about security through obscurity, they're talking about, um, they're, it's kind of an insult. It's, an, it's a negative term for people that uh, use this technique. And what you should imagine this is like, if it were in the real world, is you should imagine something like a book that has had the pages hollowed out so that it can serve as a secret hiding place. Maybe you could put money in it, maybe you could put a passport in it, um, some other kind of valuables. You would put the money in this hollowed out book, you'd close the book and you'd put it on the bookshelf. Um, and this is kind of an analogy to security by obscurity. And the reason why is because as long as no one knows which one of the books on the bookshelf is that secret hollowed out book, your money is safe. As long as that book is obscure, as long as that book is hidden, your money and whatever else you put in it is safe. The problem is, is that if it's ever found, uh, your money's gone. Whatever you're hiding in the book is gone. And it, the only thing that's keeping your money safe is obscurity, the fact that the book is hidden. Right? Another way that you could imagine uh, putting uh, valuables, securing valuables, is something that's um, considered or called security by design. And the principle behind security by design is that you're not relying on the fact that something is hidden in order to keep something safe. An analogy for this would be like a bank vault. You know, when you imagine a bank vault or safe deposit boxes at a bank, you imagine an enormous door that's, uh, you know, probably 12 inches of steel and it's bulletproof and you've got a very complicated combination lock on the front of it. And if you want to get to that money, you probably have to bring in two or three people who each know a portion of the uh, password or the, or the um, combination in order to get in, in order to get that money. Now this is different from security through obscurity because there's no question about where the money is. Everyone knows that the money is in the bank vault. And so what's keeping your money safe is not the fact that no one knows where it is, but the fact that the security mechanisms that are around the money are very strong and they're able to with, uh, withstand you know, any, you know, any kind of attack, um, generally speaking. And so in computational systems, security by design is considered a much stronger, um, much more reliable way in order to do, develop computational sy systems. So when we bring this into um, computer code, if you think about security by obscurity, you're thinking about things like hiding your computer code, not letting anyone see the um, mechanisms or the algorithms that you use. Um, maybe it means hiding your website putting a website up somewhere but not telling anyone where it is because if they found it, they would be able to find a list of all your keys or they would be able to interact with your system to send money without password, something like that. 
Um, maybe it also means not telling people where the computers are that are involved in the transfer of money because if they knew where the computers were, they could get involved, they could intercept the money um, in the transmission for some reason. You know, the reason why this doesn't work is because the internet is filled with millions and billions of people out there who just stumble on things. There are just too many eyes that are wandering through the internet um, and you only need one of those pairs of eyes to discover your hidden thing for your security by obscurity to fall. Not only are there too many um, eyes out there, but there are computers out there that are searching too. If you know a little bit about the way that Google does their work, uh, an enormous amount of their resources is devoted to just scouring the internet for any web page they don't know about and then making it available and making it visible to anyone. So anytime you try and design a system using security by obscurity, where you think that you're going to keep your system secure by hiding the mechanisms, it, it's eventually going to fail if you become a valuable enough target. And so in contrast, security by design is where you use well-established algorithms and you make it completely available and you make it completely visible to people. And what's um, keeping your system secure is not the fact that it's hidden, but the fact that you have passwords or cryptographic keys that, keep, that you keep hidden and offline in very secure systems so that even though people can see your encrypted data and even though people know the algorithm and know where uh, the computers are, it's like a bank vault. It's not enough to know where it is. You have to know uh, the mechanism in order to get through the security. All right. So this enables, if you use security by design, you can allow people to see your code and make sure that your code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And um, you can allow people to know where your, how your system is set up. So here, for example, here I'll, I'll pull up on the side um, a bit of code uh, that implements uh, one. Okay, so the Bitcoin, we know that the Bitcoin uh, protocol is an algorithm. There are many computer programs that implement that algorithm. Here is some code that I just took a screenshot of that, dis that shows one program implementing the Bitcoin algorithm. And as you can see, and if you want to go to the website, you can go through all the code. You can see all those details. And on top of that, the algorithm itself that was described initially uh, by Satoshi in the paper that uh, we made available to you guys, that's public as well. So the algorithm is public, the code is public. And so what is keeping this system secure is not the fact that things are hidden, but the fact that security is being managed through passwords. Or what we're gonna use for the rest of this lecture is a more technically correct term, which is not passwords, but cryptographic keys. And we use that term rather than passwords because it suggests that we're using very specific kinds of encryption. Whereas when you say password, it's a little ad hoc. It's not clear exactly what you mean when you say password and exactly what mechanisms you're using to keep something secure when you use a password. When you use a cryptographic key, you're using a cryptographic protocol. Um, that needs to be described more, but it's more technically correct. Okay, so now we've already talked a little bit about hash codes. Um, it's a good starting point for talking about cryptographic keys because they plays into some of the ways that you can use them. But one thing to point out is that when we're thinking about hash codes, um, everything that was in that evaluation, that was in that system was open or public. Uh, there was a bad guy, and the bad guy was trying to replace your good data with the bad guys, we'll call, we'll call him Dr. Evil, him or her, Dr. Evil. Um, the, Dr. Evil was trying to replace your good data with their bad data. And so what we did is we introduced the idea of a hashing algorithm that will take that data and will produce a fingerprint that gives us some assurance that if some point in the future we receive this large amount of data, that it's the data that was meant to um, come to us because it will have the same fingerprint or the same hash as uh, the first person who dealt with the data. So, um, you know, Alice has the data. She takes a cryptographic, I mean, she takes a hash of that data. She sends the hash to me and then she sends the data to me. I calculate the hash of the data and if the hash is matched, then I can be pretty confident that the data hasn't been manipulated, that Dr. Evil hasn't replaced my good data with uh, bad data, okay? So when, when we write this down, remember, we can, we can use um, a, a graphical representation 
or we can write it in a more mathematical representation where we say we have a hash function that takes some um, message, some data, and it produces uh, some fingerprint. Um, and we'll just say H for hash code. And remember what we said is that if you have H, it's very, very hard to recover the message itself. In fact, it's basically impossible. Um, this, is, this is sort of a more mathematical uh, way of representing that. Okay? All right, now, here's the thing though. What if our concern isn't about data integrity? Data integrity is what a hash will, will um, assert for us. What if our concern instead is that we actually have some data itself that we want to keep secret? How are we going to be able to get our secret data to someone else if we're going to send it across the public internet where who knows who's going to be looking at it? Bad guys, telecommunications companies, um, whatever, adversary, it, whatever adversary you're thinking of. It's going across basically a public internet. You need some way to be able to move your data from one place to another and not enable it to be examined. Um, because for example, if you're sending money, you don't want someone to be able to take your money. So rather than um, just taking a hash of it, we're going to keep that data secret and we're going to use a cryptographic key. We call it a key because we're going to use it to lock the data and then we're going to use that same key to unlock the data on the other side. So cryptographic key is something that's uh, a little bit more specific and precise term for a password for encrypting our data. All right, so imagine that you have these things that are secret and that you don't want anyone to know. All right, you're going to have a key, your cryptographic key, which is like a password. You have your data that you want to keep secret as well. And those are secret and those are private. But what is going to be open and what's going to be public using security through design principles is the algorithm. The algorithm is going to be pu public and the encrypted data is going to be pu public as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to rely on the fact that this algorithm encrypts the data so well that it's impossible to recover the original data without knowledge of the key. Right? So the sender using the key and the data gives it to the algorithm and produces encrypted data. Meanwhile, that encrypted data travels across the internet and it arrives at the receiver. The receiver is now in a private environment and by using the same key put into the algorithm can recover that original data. All right, so this is, a, this is basically an encryption and decryption uh, process. And that's how it's described graphically. To look at it in a more mathematical notation, you know, you might, you might write it down something like this. You might say that we have uh, a function, that's our algorithm, and as input, it takes the data that we want to encrypt and a key. And what it's going to produce is it's going to produce encrypted data. All right? That encrypted data we can show to anyone we want because it doesn't reveal anything about our original data that we had. If we want to recover our original data, we need to have knowledge of the key. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, if this is the encryption algorithm, we're going to use the related decryption algorithm. They're, they're generally considered the same algorithm, but you use it in, in the backwards way. And we're going to pass it the encrypted data and the key, and the result is going to be the original data that we had um, before we sent our encrypted data across the internet. Now, you should recognize that this is very different than the hash because we're actually going backwards. We're not taking a fingerprint. We're ending up with something from which we can recover the original data if we know the key. All right? So, in a technical term, what we call this is we call this a symmetric cryptographic key. We call it symmetric because we're using the same key to encrypt our data, to lock our data, as we're using to unlock our data at the other side. All right. Symmetric cryptographic key turns plain data into encrypted data so that you can send it across a public internet and it remains safe using security by design principles. Even if you know the algorithm, and even if you know the algorithm, and even if you have the encrypted data, you can't recover this data without having the key. And this again is security by design. All right. Some examples of algorithms, cryptographic algorithms, that you can use as this function are go by the names 
such as 3DES, they're all kind of technical names, um, AES, um, Blowfish, uh, Cast5, RC4, and you know maybe two fish is another good one. So these are all examples of different functions, different algorithms that you can use that have this property. And they're designed by different people who have different concerns about the process and the way in which this is done. All right? So that's an introduction to the idea of a symmetric cryptographic key. Use the same key to lock your data as to unlock your data. The next step is going to be, uh, the next thing that you might want to do is you might want to go online and um, try to unlock and lock some data using a symmetric key algorithm. If you're taking the course that's associated with this video, we'll have some instructions on how to do that as well. Okay, thanks.